This is a continuation of our look at the first unclean spirit, so I'm going to pick up immediately where I left off on the last part. The Jewish writer Louis Finkelstein says in his book, The Jews, Their History, Culture and Religion, Volume 2, this, under the subheading The Jews, Krogman says, quote, A Jew belongs not to a race, but to a Jewish community, end quote. Seltzer presents this definition. For our purpose, we shall define the word Jew to include all individuals of the so-called white races of mankind who, by virtue of family tradition, do practice or whose ancestors did practice the religion of Judaism. Then he goes on, this is in line with Parr's conclusion, based on the study of blood types, that, quote, there is serological evidence that the Jews are a religion rather than a race, end quote. And also Finkelstein says, the non-Jew who accepts our faith is welcomed as a full member of the Jewish community. So as you study Jewry, you quickly realize that there are multiple pathways to becoming a Jew. Firstly, you might actually be born a Judean, that is, of the tribe of Judah. And by the way, Judah is only one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Actually, there are 13 tribes in all. The term Jew in the Bible was never used, is never used anywhere to identify all 12 tribes. This is what Bible teachers say, but it is actually not found in the Bible. Bible teachers make tremendous assumptions about what they believe the Bible really means to say, but they have got it quite wrong. And they also totally ignore the facts which are readily available. Secondly, a person could adopt Judaism as their religion, as we saw in Esther 8 and Matthew 23, and this is in fact a very common pathway for anyone to become a Jew, and that's not making anything up, that is a statement of fact. Thirdly, you might be forcibly converted to Judaism, as was the case with the, with the, the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, and this case highlights that you can be an outright enemy of God, but still be a Jew. And then there is being a Jew as a result of national conversion, as it was with the Khazar empires, and from which we get the bulk of world Jewry today, Ashkenazim Jews. And so we can see from this that being born a Judean, having actual ancestry to Jude of the Bible is only one of several pathways to becoming a Jew. And the reality is that the bulk of world Jewry today are not actual Judeans. They are not descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now we are talking about the coming forth of three unclean spirits like frogs. And in terms of the timing of this, we are expecting this to start to come about with the drying up of the great river Euphrates, that is, with the end of the Ottoman Empire. So in this context, I'm now going to include a quote from Henry Grattan Guinness concerning the Jews. And I want to be clear, Guinness uh, viewed the Jews as most Christian folk do today. They say they are Jews, therefore they must be the actual descendants of the Judeans uh, of the Bible, those born from Judah. So when Guinness writes, he is writing in support of the Jews. He sees them as the original inhabitants coming back home. What is of interest to us, however, is that, as, as Guinness goes on and points out, Jewry started to make tremendous strides on the world stage at the same time, the Ottoman Empire was coming to an end, and that is striking. We are considering one of the unclean spirits that came forth onto the world stage at this time, and which is still with us now, causing all kinds of trouble. In his book, Light for the Last Days, Grattan Guinness says this, now, it is notorious that everywhere in Europe an extraordinary tendency of capital to concentrate in Jewish hands is observable of late. During the ten years, 
1854 to 1864, the Rothschilds alone furnished about 112 millions in loans to England, Austria, Prussia, France, Russia and Brazil, besides many millions to smaller states. All over Germany, the relation of the Jews to the finances of the country is causing great anxiety. The anti-Semite petition circulated in 1880 says, quote, The fruits of Christian labor are harvested by the Jews. Capital is concentrated in Jewish hands. End quote. He continues, the Jews are becoming also the actual or, or virtual owners of the soil through a large part of Central and Eastern Europe. In all the continental countries, the proportion of Jews found in the wage earning class is exceedingly small compared to the number of Gentiles, while in the capitalist class it is, on the other hand, very large, quite out of all proportion. A large number of parallel facts, facts might be cited, and they become more conspicuous continually. The power and influence of the Jewish people have risen, of course, with their political standing and their increase in wealth. They form a very large proportion of the educated class in Germany, Hungary, Austria, and other countries. The control of the press also on the continent has fallen into their hands. They occupy seats in the continental chambers of deputies as well as in our own parliament. Of course, the situation of the Jewish control of international finance is very well known. Their control of the major publishing houses, the media, the movie industry and their influence on world government has only ever grown. Graden Guinness seems to have viewed this as a good thing. However, when so much is in the hands of so few, and also a people that actively hate the Lord Jesus Christ and Christianity, and also who have no ancestral tie to Palestine, you know for certain that there is an evil spirit at work behind all of this. Ratten Guinness continues, The Palestine Exploration Society has done a most important work in preparing the way for Jewish restoration, and many thoughtful and judicious writers have already suggested that the only way to settle the Eastern question, so far as Palestine is concerned, is for the Jews themselves to have it back. Easy, so he thinks. He continues, every stage in the dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire is a stage in the direction of the liberation of Palestine and the restoration of the Jews. And of course, this view continues strongly to this very day and is in fact pushed along by many so-called evangelical Christian churches. They want the land to be handed back to the Jews, every single inch of it, at the expense of the Palestinians, and this is very strange indeed, strange coming from professing Christians. They will support the Jews at all costs and are willing to step all over the Palestinians who, who have so little. Amazing but true, this is the way it is. The church world is crazy. The effects of the rise of modern Jewry as a major player on the world stage in finance, the media, politics, among other things, being in possession of the ancient land of Israel in the Middle East has had tremendous global consequences. I think they're so obvious I don't need to go on and explain that further. Also, the fact that Christian folk, the majority of Christian folk, also believe that these people are the rightful heirs to Palestine only adds more fuel to the fire. The C.I. Schofield Reference Bible, which came about as all of this was developing, which came out in 1909, combined the false Roman Catholic teaching of a coming future man of sin during a period of seven years of great tribulation this was combined together with the teaching that the Jews were God's people and the C.I. Schofield Reference Bible was devoured by millions of Christians around the world and the damage that this has caused has been tremendous. The book called 
On the Road to Armageddon, How Evangelicals Became Israel's Best Friend by Timothy Weber shows how futurist teaching combined with the view that the Jews are God's chosen people deeply affects USA foreign policy in the, in the Middle East. The book examines the fact that American evangelicals continually lobby the US government to give more and more money to the Israeli state. It looks at how American Christians seem to largely ignore Palestinian Christians. Why it is that the Jews can do no wrong even when they kill the Palestinians and why it is that the Jews are so friendly towards the American evangelical community, yet at the very same time they continue to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. They are at total odds with Christianity, yet they have the full support of the Christian movement in America. Amazing. Among other things, the book says, over one-third of those Americans who support Israel report that they do so because they believe the Bible teaches that the Jews must possess their own country in the Holy Land before Jesus can return. After the founding of Israel in 1948 and its expansion after the Six-Day War, dispensationalists, and they are people who believe in the uh, in futurism, the coming man of sin, and so on. Dispensationalists aggressively promoted their ideas with the confidence that Bible prophecy was being fulfilled for all to see. Since the mid-1990s, tens of millions of people who have never seen a prophetic chart or listened to a sermon on the Second Coming have read one or more novels in the Left Behind series, which has become the most effective disseminator of dispensationalist ideas ever. And so we can see that the situation today is that fiction, fictional books and movies are the main school of teaching Christians about end time events. Who would have ever had thought such a ridiculous situation could have arisen? But there we have it. Next, I'm now going to talk very briefly about communism, which I mentioned near the beginning of this part dealing with the first unclean spirit from the mouth of the dragon. I said previously that there was a relationship between red communism and modern Jewry. Many 20th century historicists see the ideology of communism as one of the unclean spirits in and of itself, and I think that this is understandable. Atheistic communism was one of the deadly demonic forces that was unleashed by the French Revolution. And back when we looked at this uh, under the pouring out of the first vial of wrath, you might recall that I mentioned that the Roman Catholic Church was the midwife to communism. When we looked at the pouring out of the first vial of wrath, we discussed the involvement of Adam Weishaupt who was both a Jew and a Jesuit professor of theology. Adam Weishaupt founded the Illuminati, and while their membership at the time was never very great, they did count among their membership a number of very influential people in France and Germany. The aims of the Illuminati were, number one, the abolition of monarchy and all ordered government, number two, the abolition of private property, Number three, the abolition of inheritance. Number four, the, the abolition of patriotism. Number five, the abolition of the family, meaning marriage and all morality, and the institution of communal education. And number six, number six the abolition of all religion. All these things fed directly into the already polluted lifeblood of the French Kingdom and atheistic socialism followed together with unrestrained immorality and violent revolution. At its very inception there was this Jew, Adam Weishaupt, who was of the synagogue of Satan and I can't make it any clearer than that. The principles set forth by Adam Weishaupt were further developed by the Jew Karl Marx from which we get communism, which came onto the world stage following the Bolshevik October Revolution in 1917, which was itself Jewish-inspired, funded, and led. 
So to be clear, the reason why I am including the ideology of communism together with Judaism and modern Jewry is because communism was augmented by modern Jewry and it is an ideology that came onto the world stage through modern Jewry. It is compatible with Judaism. Judaism is not the Old Testament of the Bible as so many believe it is. Judaism is the religion of the Babylonian Talmud and it is totally against that which is set forth in the scriptures. Karl Marx was a Jew who came from an old family of rabbis and brilliant Talmudic scholars. The Bolshevik Revolution was financed by Jewish bankers on Wall Street and the majority of Bolsheviks were Jews. Not less than 75% of the Bolsheviks were Jews. They went over to Russia to start a revolution and they succeeded. According to a book that I have here, in 1983, 14 of the 23 Politburo members were Jews, 90% of Russian diplomats were Jews, and the majority of senior officers in the Red Army have been Jews, and also the men in charge of the Russian secret police have all been Jews. Concerning Esau, who is Edom, and whose descendants are to be found in modern Jewry, the prophetic utterance of his father Isaac is worth commenting upon. In Genesis 27 verse 40 we read, And by thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. There are two things to note here in the prophecy. Firstly, by thy sword shalt thou live. The ways of Edom are prophesied to be violent. Violence is part and parcel of Edom and his descendants. Secondly, the prophecy states originally that while the elder shall serve the younger, the time would come where it says here, thou shalt, shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck meaning Esau and his descendants would gain the ascendancy over Jacob. And in my opinion, this is what is occurring in the world today. The descendants of Edom, who are in modern Jewry, have the ascendancy over the Jacob, Israel, Western nations of the world. Now let's consider communism in connection with all of this. Communism is not confined to Russia. It's right throughout our Western nations. It's throughout our political system, schools, and universities. From the Epoch Times, we read this article about communism, the leading ideological cause of death in the 20th century. It says, of all the plagues to ravage humanity, from the Black Death to cancer, one of the deadliest has been a virulent idea that has claimed millions of souls. The brutal brainchild of Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto, promised utopia on earth. All one needed to do was overturn society and throw off the ruling class through violent revolution. The road to paradise was red. The colour red is associated directly with communism and this is because Esau is red, the Edomites are red and Esau is in Jewry. That's just the way it is. The road to paradise was red, built on a new social order, built by destroying traditional beliefs, social structures, property ownership and governance. According to Stefan Kortois's The Black Book of Communism, communism is responsible for 100 million deaths. A number total that far exceeds Nazism, which left 16 million dead, and it eclipses the 20th century death tolls of lung cancer, diabetes, and homicides. The different aspects of modern Jewry, their control of the Israeli state, which they wrested from the British, their control or effect over the hearts and minds of millions and millions of Christians all over the world is completely amazing. The Jews do not change and become Christians, they remain as they are totally opposed to Christ and Christianity yet, but yet at the same time Christians seem to think all of this is completely wonderful and it's absolutely crazy. 
their bringing forth of communism onto the world stage, their involvement in international finance and politics, their control of the publishing houses and the media industry, marks this out as one of the three unclean spirits that has gone forth into the world to bring the nations together into conflict. Those that believe that the Jews of today returning to the Middle East mark the prophetic fulfillment of God's people returning to their homeland are deceived. Quite simply, it is a case of identifying the wrong people in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if you would like to know who the right people are and what the right place is in the right time, then please ensure that you view my series on the two houses of Israel, as I am sure that that will be a blessing to you. And finally, I will add that it is very common to hear from Christian folk, Christian folk who believe in end times prophecy and prophecy teachers and so on, it is common to hear that all eyes must be on Israel. Israel is the key to the whole end times thing. And to this, I'm going to add that this is only correct if you know which Israel you are talking about. Long ago in the Bible, we read the story where Jacob disguised himself as Esau in order to deceive his father so to obtain the birthright promise, which was going to be his in any case. The descendants of Edom are still in the world today. The descendants of Esau are still with us today, and they learned something from this ancient deception. They learned that if they dressed themselves up as the descendants of Jacob, then they would be able to deceive them and steal the birthright back. And in fact, the actual lineal descendants of Jacob in the world today would almost gladly give them everything they are so deceived. But God is going to intervene and God will save, save Jacob. He will save Israel as he has promised. Now, when you view the series on the two houses of Israel, what I've just said will start to become much clearer to you. I realize that uh, what I'm saying will be controversial to some, but please bear with me. Hear the whole story out before you cast your judgment. Additionally, for further study, you may also wish to look at my series on Lazarus and the rich man, as I think that this would also help. Lastly, in case anyone listening to this series is of the view that somehow I am against all Jews, I would like to remind everyone what the scripture says. Romans 2, verse 28, verse 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And I'm going to say amen to that. Amen. Many Christian folk believe that this verse is teaching that we become, when we become Christians, we become spiritual Jews. And that is a wrong reading of the passage. You can't change your ancestry by being born again, but you can change your destiny. Praise the Lord for that. If you are not a Jew now, you don't become a Jew when you become a Christian. What the scripture is saying is that in order to be a Jew, or more precisely a Judean under the new covenant, you have to be born again. You have to come under the new covenant. If you are a Jew, you will be born of water and of the Spirit. This is what he is saying to the Jews. If you're going to remain Jews under the new covenant, you will be born of water and of the Spirit. And with this, one would have to totally renounce Judaism and embrace the teachings of the Bible and embrace Christianity. Now, the body of Jewry does not do this. Judaism is their lifeblood. The Babylonian Talmud is their lifeblood. So by the Bible's own definition, these are not true Jews. In the New Testament, we often see two groups of Jews. The leaders, who absolutely rejected Jesus Christ and afterward Christianity, 
together with them we also find the baser sort and then there were the general people among the Jews who believed as an example John 12 verse 13 uh, they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried Hosanna blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord these were the general people but then in the same chapter down in verse 19 we read the Pharisees therefore said among themselves perceive ye how ye prevail nothing behold the whole world all these Jews have gone after him in Luke 12 verse 1 we read in the meantime when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people these would be the general people among the Jewish nation at the time it says insomuch that they trode upon one another he began to say unto his disciples first of all beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees that is the rulers of the Jews the leaven of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy in John 12 verse 10 we get one group of Jews but the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death and then there were the other general people among the Jews in John in the very next verse where it says because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus in Acts 17 verse 4 we read and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks a great multitude and of the chief women not a few but in the next verse but the Jews which believed not this would is generally always the rulership of Jewry the Jews which believed not moved with envy took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people so I would like to make it clear that to the extent that there are any actual true Judeans to be found among what we call modern Jewry then the indication from the scriptures is that they would tend to respond to the gospel as for the bulk of Jewry itself the facts stand as they are they are simply not Jews by ancestry they are Jews by conversion and included in this mix is Edom and the Edomites hate Jacob and they hate Jacob's God the Lord Jesus Christ well there is so much more to say about this matter and I could continue but I'm going to leave it here later on when I get to Revelation chapter 19 I am going to come back to the Edomites because they play a part in the great conflict mentioned in that chapter and there's no surprise because this is the very thing we are reading about in Revelation chapter 16 unclean spirits going forth into the world bringing the nations together into conflict God is definitely going to deal with this problem finally and these people are going to be taken off the scene completely so there is yet more to say about this but we're going to get to that later God bless you and I look forward to catching up with you in the next part.